Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming to the uh, annual LEPC meeting, which is uh, obviously we hold it once a year. It's part of the uh, EPCRA, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Uh, required by law to have this meeting once a year, and uh, we thank everybody for coming. I think the uh, first uh, item on the agenda is the introduction, so we know who, who everybody is. And I'm Deputy Commissioner Kevin McBride from DEP, and I'm responsible for uh, Proderva, which is Division of Emergency Response Technical Assessment, which uh, covers the LEPC. Good morning. My name is Priscilla Zubulis. I'm the Director of DERTA. And uh, also, I would like to let you know that at the end of this month, I'm retiring. So, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the introduction? We'll all right. So, all right. I'm the uh, director there. So thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. That would be a proper send-off. Uh, okay, boss. I'm Harry Meyer. I'm the deputy director of operations for DERTA. Um, good morning. My name is Joanne Nurse. I'm the deputy director for Right to Know program. Safa Yakub, Right to Know program. I'm Elena Ferloni, also with DERTA, uh, as a dust material specialist. Anthony Esposito, I'm with the Staten Island President's Office. Hi, I'm Kabria Karim. I'm with the New York City Department of Health uh, with uh, Biodetection Preparedness Response Unit. Howard Pollock, Speaker's Office, New York City Council. I'm um, Richard Tom, Assistant Area Director, Manhattan OSHA. Rob Tavog, New York City Emergency Management Agency Council. Rachel Haneke, New York City <coughs> Department of Health, Emergency Planning and Operations. Andrew Natoli, uh, excuse me, Andrew Natoli, New York State Office of Emergency Management. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mostly London, New York City Emergency Management, Transportation Infrastructure. Seth Goodhart's New York City Department of Health Director of Emergency Planning and Operations for Environmental Health. Randy Austin, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm the school response supervisor for the New York City region. Richard Iacere, um, with the uh, AP, that environmental uh, protection, uh, New York City Transit, MTA. Sanjay Orjas, New York City Emergency Management, Director of Legal Affairs. Robert Wilson, New York City Emergency Management, Deputy Director of Legal Affairs. Oh. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. And hopefully, we'll have a, uh, a good meeting. It shouldn't be too long. We have uh, some important items on the agenda. Uh, the first item that I want to announce, uh, but uh, Basilios uh, announced it himself. But I, <laughs> Basilios uh, is a so I've been. Uh, the Dirta director has been there in place for the last three years, but he's been with DEP for almost 35 years. 37. 30, 37. It was 37 years. Uh, but he's decided he's going to go on to a new stage of his life. And June 29th, Vaz will be retiring. And I just want to wish him well and thank him for his service in uh, Dirta for the last three years and also for his 37 years in the DEP. So we wish him well. But just uh, as Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Serving DP and Derda, and he has been uh, an honor and privilege to serve under you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as we move forward, just for the people in the room, so you know uh, who the contacts are uh, in the interim, as we transition to our new leadership team, uh, Deputy Director Harry Meyer, who's been the Deputy Director in charge of Emergency Response is now going to be the acting director of DERTA, taking a visitor spot. And Joanne Nurse, who's been our deputy director of the Right to Know program, is going to be the de deputy director of DERTA. She'll be the number two, the acting deputy director of DERTA. So we wish them well in their new assignments, and hopefully the, uh, there will be a seamless flow to the new leadership. So thank you very much. So I guess we'll head right into the agenda. First on the agenda is the update on the Tier 2 submissions. That's the uh, the right to know. And uh, Joanne, you going to? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone, again. I'll give you a little update on the right to know program, what we've been doing so far this year. On January 11, 2018, the program hosted a training workshop on Tier 2 filing for the Fruno Directors Association. This workshop was held at the Maple Grove Cemetery at 127-15 Kew Gardens Road in Queens. On February 27, 2018, the program also hosted a compliance advisor training class for the members of the Small Business Association. This training was held at DEP headquarters. Um, a little bit about our filing. This year, the Right to Know assisted two consultant firms to migrate their clients from filing hard copy submissions to online filing. 
approximately 216 hard copy submissions were converted to online filing during this process. Under my direction, the risk management plan under review group was formed. The purpose of this group was to improve efficiency of the risk management plan review process. The group is comprised of emergency response personnel and right to know inspectors. A new tier two form has been developed to include the new physical and health categories as mandated by the EPA. It is currently under review by the New York City Law Department and the Mayor's Office of Operation. Upon completion of the review process, a notification for a public hearing will be posted on the city record. We are hoping that this new form will take effect for the next tier two filing period, which begins on January 1st, 2019. That's a little bit of what we're doing so far. Okay, and I'm assuming we, we, we refer to the right to know, uh, we refer to it as it, it's tier two, but uh, just in case anybody in the room is the first time attending the meeting, uh, it's the management of hazardous materials for uh, different uh, corporations, stores, and uh, different facilities that have to file what, what they have on site if they meet certain thresholds and certain quantities and certain type chemicals that they have to file with us. So that's the, the, the system we call the tier two system. Any questions on that? Okay. Next, uh, we're going to move to our Hazardous Substance Advisory Board meeting. As, uh, as required by law, we have to hold quarterly Hazardous Advisory uh, Substance uh, meetings. The one quarter we combine into the LEPC meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to Joanne. You're going to start the uh, read the minutes from the last meeting. And the meeting began at approximately 10.10 10 a.m. on March 12, 2018, with the reading of the last meeting minutes by Joanne Nurse, myself. The meeting minutes were accepted as read. Mr. Vasilius Zumbulius read the 2017 tier two year metrics. He reported that the right to know conducted three workshops demonstrated how to use the online tier two filing system. The right to know received 9,669 submissions as of March 12, 2018. 440 submissions were from new facilities. A total of 9,200 facilities submitted online and 469 facilities submitted hard copy reports. Right to know has 368 risk management plans as of March 9, 2018. An additional 39 facilities are required to submit RMPs. For fiscal year 2018, the Arctic Inspection Unit performed 6,260 inspections as of March 9, 2018. 264 facilities went out of business and 410 were in violation of the law. Mr. Zambolius reported that the right to know is currently updating the facility inventory form to include the new physical and health categories as mandated by the EPA. He also reported that there is still no update on the Hazardous Substance Advisory Board vacancies. The memorandums of an understanding between New York City DEP and Con Edison um, and National Grid has been fully executed. Mr. Harry Meyer reported that there is a 2% increase in natural gas jobs in comparison to the same period last fiscal year. The upcoming deployments are St. Patrick's Day Parade, which will take place on Saturday, March 17, 2018, and New York City Health Half Marathon on Sunday, March 18, 2018. Our future deployments are the Yankees opening day, the MEX opening day, and the 9-11 Memorial Walk. Kevin Clark from OEM inquired about the local emergency planning committee meeting date. Mrs. Zambolius reported that the tentative date is set for June 15, 2018. The meeting adjourned at 10.20 a.m. Safa, this is all still part of the HASB, uh, as far as the agenda. Safa, you're going to get the tier two metrics? Okay. As of March 9, 2018, RTK received a total of uh, 10,937 tier two submission. 611 were for new facility, and total of 10,141 facility submit online comparing to 794 facilities submitted hard copy. And we have an increase of 3% increase. Uh, people file hard copy, submit hard, uh, uh, online. For the risk management plan, 
um, the right to know program have total of 370 uh, report, risk management plan report on file as of June 8, 2018, an additional 39 facility required to submit the RMP. For inspection, the right to know uh, conduct uh, inspection of total 9,466 inspection during physical year of 2018. 1,025 were in violation of the law for not filing the tier two by March 1st of 2018. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Elena, you're up next with the ER, ECR ECRM2 update. update. Just, to, just make sure everybody knows what it is, explain it. Yes, ECRM2 stands for Effective Chemical Risk Management Program. It started as part of the executive order in 2013 because of the West Texas incident, a lot of first responders were killed. So it was a, the goal was to establish some best practices for interagency collaboration, data sharing, and um, just make sure that LEPC's first responders had ready access to key information when responding to an emergency and chemical facilities. Um, the last in-person meeting was actually in uh, June of 2016, and um, the group used to meet monthly uh, over the phone, conference calls, and the last one was in October 2016. Then there was a long gap when we did not meet, and we finally uh, reinstated the conference calls this March 2018, and uh, it was established that it would be quarterly. And uh, we actually somewhat met uh, this week, the past two days, in Jersey City as part of the regional response team meeting for Region 2 with other agencies where the EPA, who is one of the chair of the program together with the Coast Guard, they uh, basically restarted the program saying this executive order comes unfunded so we have to be kind of realistic as to what we can do and uh, what we can keep doing long term. Data sharing was always one of the big priorities but it's um, Work has been kind of slow because agencies have a hard time sharing all their information, some of it very sensitive, they kind of keep it close to the chest. So now the focus of the group is to share red flags and things that are just relevant to the agency for interagency collaboration as opposed to sharing the entire databases, which was not very practical. Um, so they're working on that. Uh, we're trying to get so communication through referral processes, uh, sharing info, joint work, communication. The next project would be to have another um, industry day or uh, agency day where agencies come together probably at the EPA facility and uh, they talk about a case study of interagency collaboration, either a success story of a lesson learned story where we uh, have um, um, not necessarily upper management, but people in the field, responders and inspectors interact and get to know other agencies and uh, see how each other works and what their, um, what their field of, you know, of action is. Um, so the next, the next conference call should be uh, next week. In terms of other things that were mentioned at the RRT2 meeting this week that may be of relevance to the audience, um, the Coast Guard brought up, uh, brought up an increase in, um, in congestion in New York Harbor, so they're foreseeing that there's going to be more incidents of collisions and grounding that may result in fuel spills, so they're looking into that as an area of concern. Um, also concerned about uh, the electric fluid spills and petroleum spills that have almost doubled since the past year, and they are attributing it to um, to aging infrastructure. Some pipes are like 40, 50 years old at this point, so they are starting to uh, be more sensitive to leaks and spills. Uh, and Conad was present, and they mentioned what they're doing in terms of their program of uh, monitoring and tank readings and to to respond as soon as they can to this other problem. OSHA was there because as part of the ECR2, they, um, they're one of the chairs and they uh, brought up an issue with uh, where facilities fall between the cracks. There was uh, an explosion and a, with a fatality and 125 injured at the Verla uh, International um, Company in Newburgh, New York last November. 
and this facility was not uh, expected to report under, uh, didn't fall under APRA or EPA, and the FDA does not require them to file their inventory. So they kind of fell through the cracks when responders responded. They had no idea what was in this facility in terms of chemicals. So this was one of the issues that OSHA and EPA are going to work closely to try to close those loopholes that address in these facilities. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily an issue for New York City. We, our thresholds are much lower, so and we inspect those facilities every year. So I think we're in good shape. But this is uh, an area of concern for for the reach, for region two. Uh, EPA, <laughs> Mr. Austin was there, <laughs> and uh, he had some uh, some interesting uh, updates that he might want to share himself. Uh, well. What I did was presentation on the oil spills uh, that we've seen over the past year. Uh, we talked about the Bayside Oil Terminal having a spill, 27,000 gallons into Gravesend Bay. We talked about the Con Ed Farragut substation that occurred, I believe it was in April. Uh, it was about 30,000 gallons of dielectric fluid went from a uh, large transformer, leaked out and found its way into the East River. Uh, We've had numerous Con Edison events, as Alina indicated. Uh, we've, we've had uh, a lot of their transmission lines. Uh, all of their major transmission lines are, are oil-cooled dielectric fluid, which is a synthetic mineral oil. They have a lot of problems with these things uh, corroding and leaking. Uh, they're in the process of both responding to the spill events and also coming up with a program to do major repairs and replacement to these cables uh, and these lines throughout the city. So we talked about that, and that's become an up-and-coming thing with the regional response team. Major urban areas have a lot of uh, oil-cooled uh, electrical equipment, transformers, feeder lines, things of that like, and they are starting to pose a major contamination issue. Uh, a third of the oil spills that DEC gets uh, in New York City are, are related to transformer dielectric fluid spills, and that's part of our active work. So we, we talked about that, Mike. They, just to, to, to comment on the Burler event, that was a cosmetic firm that had the problem. Um, whatever reason, the materials they had uh, just didn't meet thresholds in terms of reporting requirements or prevention requirements uh, in terms of what the state required, the federal government required, the locals required. They were working with a chemical, which uh, I have it in my notes, it's a name of about 37 letters long. And uh, Jill, Harry we're wiping something that. down. <laughs> yeah, Harry could probably recite it. Was it. <laughs> and, it was a flammable. Uh, it was, and they wiped it, and just the friction of wiping it caused an explosion. And uh, it wasn't the gentleman who was impacted by that that was killed, but it was the person who came in as a secondary rescuer who was killed by the event. So that obviously got a lot of attention, and you know the fact that why wasn't there prevention in that case? So it fell through the cracks. That's why programs like this are so important that we find out what's out there in the world to protect ourselves accordingly. Yeah. And a last, uh, last thing to mention, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab was at the meeting and they, they said they're working on a FEMA city planner resource. Uh, right now the tool that they have is a planning tool for cities to plan for large scale uh, emergencies. In this case they were working on, uh, they prepared it and set it up for improvised nuclear devices. New York City is one of the cities that they worked on, that they modeled um, for this kind of scenario. But what they're looking at now is to expand it into the chemical and bio threats. So they would like to have a chem city planner resource and they're looking for input from LEPCs and other other uh, players in the, in the in the field to um, to give them input on possible release points, transportation routes, what kind of chemicals would be most likely to be um, to be the cause of such a release in New York City. So what we have, where do we have it, where the, the incidents were. So they're trying. They're still putting their product together. They think they're going to release it in 2019, early 2019, probably, and. Um, Again, it's a planning tool, it's not an operational tool, but it could be effective for cities to set up their, you know, their resources and assess routes and transportation, how they could be effective. So, that's what I have. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, uh, Ben. Appreciate it. Harry, I think you're next up on, still, we're still on the Hazardous Substance Advisory Board. Uh, Harry's going to go over the metrics for the emergency responses. Okay. Uh, basically, I have the information that is running 
year over year from, I guess, fiscal year, last fiscal year through May, because that's the best comparison. Year over year, we're slightly above the last year number of responses at 3,239 versus 3,171. It's a small change of about 2%, which was actually at the March meeting, that was the projection that I had, we're at about 2%. Uh, but again, one of the things that is still, you know, we have stability on the overall responses. I mean, we have various categories that we uh, uh, group together. We have abandoned chemicals, chemical odors, chemical fires, chemical spills, explosive and WMD chemicals. Those are basically uh, your, uh, uh, I would call them suspicious substance jobs. Those are looped into that. Petroleum spills, PCB related transformer spills and fires, uh, various indoor air complaints or carbon monoxide releases, special investigations. Well, one of the uh, responses that I will talk about later is basically grouped into this special investigation. So that's the only one on record. Then there's asbestos, but uh, even though DERDA responds initially to asbestos uh, calls, we usually transfer those to the asbestos response unit, but we are the first responders, or not, I'm sorry, we're the first emergency responders on scene, but we actually transfer to that unit to carry the responsibility of the job. And then of course we have one category for building collapses, which, you know, any sort of facade or issues of that nature. But like I said, the year over year is about 2%, and as expected, numbers are pretty uniform other than natural gas, which are higher now because the public is more aware of natural gas issues and is more uh, prone to making complaints, which is a positive thing. And of course that will eventually, again, I will be talking about the MOUs, but I'll stop at this point. So year over year, slightly over, uh, the responses uh, and, or the special details that we completed since the March reporting period include now the five Bora bike tour on May 6th, the Brooklyn Marathon on May 19th, the Salute to Israel Parade on June 3rd, and of course the most recent being the Puerto Rican Day Parade on June 10th. Now we have several upcoming events for this month, we have the Heritage Pride Parade, which is scheduled for June 24th. And then, of course, moving forward, we have July 4th, the Macy's uh, Fireworks. And then, naturally, the two longer deployments, which are the U.S. Open, which uh, runs from August 27th to September 9th, with August 25th being Kids Day, which is a partial deployment. And then after that, I will stop at the U.N. General Assembly which will run from September 17th to September 21. So that's basically the numbers update as well as the deployment update. Thank you, Harry. And with the, when he's talking about the, the details that uh, Derda responds to, that's when the uh, NYPD calls a hazmat branch and they have everybody uh, you know, uh, deployed at the, uh, at the detail. So those are the details he's talking about. Uh, that sums it up for the Hazardous Substance Advisory Board. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? No? Okay. Uh, just two things. I have to go back on the agenda. One, I just said, uh, notice we have somebody else come in. You want to just say hello? Hi, I'm Rachel Solomon with New York City Emergency Management. Okay. And uh, when we jumped in with Hazard's, uh, Vaz's retirement and all those announcements, I forgot to start off with Rob to go over last year's minutes from the LEPC, so I'm going to revert back. So a lot of the numbers that were previously given are captured in this report, so I will not uh, go over them in as much detail, but last year's 26, uh, 2017 LAPC meeting began with a uh, reviewing of 2016 uh, meeting minutes. Uh, moving on, regarding the Tier 2 submissions, uh, as of May 21st, 2016, there were approximately uh, 10,400 submissions, uh, of which uh, 623 were from new facilities. Uh, the risk management plans, uh, 343 risk management plans were on file. 
As of May 2016, an additional 17 for, uh, facilities were required to submit RMPs. Um, on special events under Tier 2 submissions, uh, March 21st, 2016, New York City Small Business Services requested training classes regarding rules, regulations, Tier 2, and RTK inspections. Uh, the training classes were provided by DEP and DERDA. Uh, moving on to ECRM2 project updates. A lot of it was covered with what we already discussed, but a quick background um, to the Executive uh, Chemical Risk Management 2 project. Uh, this project sprang again from the West Texas tragedy uh, and President Obama signed executive order uh, 1364 uh, 13, to improve chemical facility safety and security. Again, this is uh, involving multiple agencies from the federal, the state, and the local level that dealing with coordination to address the issue and develop best practices. Uh, noteworthy responses from last year's uh, LEPC were the Bay Ridge events. Uh, the event started in December as of last year when the DEP, respond, uh, DEP responded to a chemical spill of an unknown substance. This chemical was eventually identified as concentrated rat poison and no one was injured. Uh, special deployments from DEP uh, were the National Team Parade, uh, Women's National Team Parade, uh, the visit from the Pope, uh, Major League Baseball playoffs, United Nations, Five Hour Bike Tour, half, Brooklyn Half Marathon, and Salute to Israel. And then if we start to review Local Law 143. After Hurricane Sandy, the city was concerned with chemicals stored in facilities near waterways or within special flood hazard areas. Uh, DEP initially released the best practices uh, advisement. Over time, local law was enacted dealing with chemical facilities that are vulnerable to extreme weather conditions. Uh, the law, at last, the law department was looking to include in the proposed regulation volumes of hazardous materials that are uh, above the reporting threshold for the community right to know, but are now uh, below the jurisdiction of the Department of Environmental Conservation when it comes to hazardous material storage. The law department uh, was preparing the regulations with legal counsel division uh, and is being promulgated. Uh, this department reviews all legislation that is promulgated by an agency before it goes through the CAPA process. The remaining questions have been submitted to DEP, uh, DEP before being cement, uh, sent to DEC. And I'll just wrap it up with that, because I feel like a lot of what is going to be discussed will be discussed here. Okay, very good. Any questions on last year's minutes? Any issues? Who are you folks dealing with in DEC on Local Law 143? You mentioned that uh, information is being submitted. Do you know who that is? Uh, I think uh, Randy Austin. That's me. <laughs> 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 we have we have several uh, representatives. I believe your council, uh, the main council for Region Two. I have to look up. We, we don't directly deal with DC. We go through the New York City right. law that's the, council. the legal department. Okay, and, so uh, it's legal to legal. Right. On that. Right. Okay. I'm just curious to follow up on if, if there's any issues there in terms of getting the response back on anything. Okay. All right, we're talking about local law 43. Right oh. over to Harry, you give him a new update. New update, okay, well, okay, actually good news on local law 143. Well, just to add a little credit where credit is due, as, as was said, the bill was actually prepared at the time by council members Van Bramer, Chin, Ferraro, James, Kuhl, Lander, Mendez, Palma, Rose, Mark, Viverito, and Ulrich. Uh, the concept behind it was, again, to address situations for facilities in, in, in the flood zone that are prone to spills during extreme weather events. As, as the law was pro, uh, passed and the department was ordered to prom promulgate regulations, the DEP worked with City Hall representatives, the New York City Law Department, the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and of course, with the representatives from DEC to come up with a proposal and a resolution for, for this issue. And we actually do have the promulgated rules and regulations now, and they are going through the capital process. 
They were just submitted a couple of weeks ago, in fact. And we did actually address issues and concerns with DEC regarding various thresholds, volume, storage times, so that we do not actually um, overlap on your regulations. What we will do is we will come to a point which are above the community right to know reporting threshold, but below the DEC required reporting threshold. The actual statement that is in the basis and purpose in the, uh, uh, the proposed regulation is to amend local law 143, well, local law 143 of 2013 is amending section 24716 of the administrative code, which is basically what we have here as our famous community right to know law, or local law 26. It is being amended by adding a new subdivision requiring that the Department of Environmental Protection promulgate rules for the proper siting and storage of hazardous substances, taking into consideration all safety issues in response after consultation with other response agencies, as well as the Law Department, the Mayor's Office of Operations, and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. DEP has developed amendments to the existing community right to know regulations, which add a new section 41-14 to require spillage prevention measures for all portable containers of hazardous substances in order to prevent releases of hazardous substances in case of an extreme weather event and to impose spillage prevention requirements for facilities <coughs> located in a special flood hazard area. The proposed rule also authorizes DEP to perform inspections at facilities and to issue summonses for violations of the rule and adds to definitions below, which are basically just clarifications and rewrites to some of our existing definitions. So for the first time, once this actually goes through the capital process, goes through the hearings, and assuming everything goes well, this will be promulgated through the Right to Know program, our inspectors will now conduct additional factors to their inspection process is for facilities in the flood prone areas. And we will basically not only provide the guidance that we've been providing all along since Superstorm Sandy on how to store chemicals, but we will now mandate procedures on how and what you must do. If you violate, it is no longer a require a recommendation, it is now actually a violationable event. And we believe that this meets the foundation of what the council proposed when they actually wrote local law 143. So at this point, we're just awaiting the process to go through. That's the latest update. Question. So, um, how are you defining flood prone areas? Are you uh, those are based on FEMA maps and agreed upon, generally agreed upon uh, protocols. The traditional floodplain maps or is it something new that's been developed? No, no, yeah. traditional floodplain maps. Okay. Um, are all the issues that are existing between DEC and DEP addressed on this matter as far as I you believe know? they are because okay. we did go back and forth, or law department went back and forth and we went back and forth with our law department to make sure that we do not uh, violate or overstep our authority. There's no redundancies. There's no redundancies. Okay, very good. There's a, a long road to get there. <laughs> yeah. If yes. you hear of any problems related to that, we now have a new regional attorney. If this was done with the regional attorney, the regional attorney has left. Uh, so we have a new regional attorney. His name is Patrick Foster. Um, if this, if something comes up, he may not be aware of it. If there's something that snag or glitch at the last minute in terms of the interrelationship between the state and the city on this matter, uh, please let me know. You have my numbers, you have how to contact me. And uh, I will follow up on it and make sure that A, he's briefed on what this is, and B, that it gets addressed whatever outstanding issues there are with legal matters between the state and the city. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Harry. All right, we're coming to the end. I think uh, just an update uh, on the MOU that has been signed with uh, Con Ed National Grid as far as uh, natural gas uh, leaks in the city. Are you just going to give it? Yeah, uh, pretty short <laughs> since I've been talking so far. Okay, basically this comes from the, uh, this stems from the 54th Street incident from uh, 2015 and basically the first uh, deputy mayor at the time, Soros, convened a task force which was basically 
OEM, DEP, FDNY, and NYPD, and we were, and, kind of and of course, and utilities, I apologize, and uh, utilities, and basically we were requested, uh, requested to uh, amend an MOU that we had in place for many years addressing natural gas leaks, but the predominant issue had to do with addressing uh, situations where you had subsurface structures, smaller structures, not manholes or you know normal conduits, but subsurface structures, because this explosion occurred in a DEP vault, which is an unattended, you know, for the type of uh, you know structure. So we went back and forth with the utilities, and we went through various you know measurements and how many jobs and all that to figure out what would be the best solution and what would be the best measurement and size to incorporate into this amended MOU. And basically, the one thing that it says now, the amended line, which is the critical one that took a long time to negotiate, is any sustained natural gas readings of more than 1.5% gas in the air and the atmosphere of utility vaults, manholes, and subsurface structures with at least a 27-inch opening that cannot be immediately relieved to below 1.5%. And basically for the purposes of this provision, we are saying sustained means a stable meter reading, reading taken pursuant to established industry manufacturers protocols. That is the critical line that had, had to be added to our original MOU. Basically, 27 inches, which is a reasonably sized structure that if it fills with gas would of course re result in a serious accident. So as of now, all any structure, plus of course our, norm, our normal sewer complaints or in a, in a manhole, basically all of the categories have been amended, but with this critical category to satisfy the requirements well, that were set by the mayor's office. These were actually executed very recently. I believe the uh, first it was uh, Con Ed, right, it was Con Ed first, and then a national grid. So these are now in place, and I would say since January of this year. That was a lot of work and cooperation between utilities, OEM, and all the other agencies involved. And uh, I'm not sure if this was clear, what, what we're referring to is when the utilities have to notify when they have a gas leak. And that, that was the issue, was, uh, the, the percentage of gas and the type of location right. of when they, we, then when we would get notified and OEM, et cetera. So that brings us to the close of the meeting, unless anybody has uh, any questions or issues they need to bring up. Just a quick button following up on that. So if, if you find it in those types of vaults, they, if, if Con Ed, but when the utility uh -huh. falls, they have to notify the utility. Uh, they, no, they notify us, they make a call, let us know that they have 1.5% or more in this particular structure. And a response comes in. How do you separate between naturally generated methane from waste and, and sewers and it can be in, in vaults well, as well as opposed well, to... Well, it's very possible, but I'm pretty sure that when the... I mean, they're the ones who are making the call to us. I mean, I understand you have the methane and you have your natural gas, which is the same predominant component <coughs> as methane. They, they basically will make the call because they know that it's in line. They have a structure somehow nearby one of these yeah. service holes. All right, so there's a, this, if it's a suspected source and they have a strong... Yeah, this, is, yeah. <clears throat> this is their requirement to notify us when right. they're aware of a certain type of leaks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't preclude the community, the, 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 the citizens from mm -hmm. calling 311 and making a complaint that they smell gas. Oh, yeah. This is specifically when Con Ed National Grid know they have a leak so, you know, small, log, whatever, it, it fits into those categories, they're required to make right. the notification. So when they have a leak in the vicinity, they check the, the structures, and if they find something, they will notify. They will basically notify you, and since it's a sustained reading, it's assumed not to be something from some kind right. of breakdown right. of waste right. or something, creating nothing, yes. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, just a quick, for this MOU, uh, does it also associate with the, the shell of the gas, so it's not just the notification of the well, they, when we get notified, yeah. our units will respond, yeah. take readings, and Con Ed and National Grid responsible for fixing it, correcting it, remediating it. We're just there to make sure it gets done. 
and it's a it's a good working relationship. Occasionally, there may be a, a commissioner's order or something given if it's you know not happening too fast. But uh, it's been a, a good working relationship with the utilities, and especially you know since they had the tragic incident a couple of years ago, uh, everybody's really on board with it. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you next year. Have a wonderful, uh, great summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.